Welcome to Afternoon Light, the podcast of the Robert Menzies Institute, hosted by Georgina Downer. 2024 marks 80 years since the founding of the Liberal Party of Australia. The party is an enduring legacy of Robert Menzies and others. Today's episode of Afternoon Light forms part of a special 10-part series to commemorate this 80th anniversary. Each of the 10 episodes will feature an author from our upcoming book on the founding of the Liberal Party, Unity in Autonomy. The book will be available from Connor Court and the Robert Menzies Institute's website in October this year. 80 years ago this year, Robert Menzies and others formed the Liberal Party of Australia. This moment marked the beginning of the two-party system that is such a defining feature of Australian politics. The Liberal Party was a successor of a series of parties of the centre-right, such as protectionists and free trade parties, the Liberal Fusion, the Nationalists and the United Australia Party. Joining me to discuss how Menzies achieved this feat is Dr David Kemp, one of Australia's most prominent historians of Australian liberalism and... I'll have to mention this conflict of interest here, a board member of the Robert Menzies Institute. Welcome to Afternoon Light, David. Thank you very much, Georgina. David, Robert Menzies and others, and we need to be clear that it wasn't just Robert Menzies who founded the Liberal Party of Australia. There were plenty of others involved and who were very important. He was intent that the Liberal Party be a party with a philosophy. That was really, really quite central to the project. What does that mean, a party with a philosophy? Don't all parties have a philosophy or was that quite an unusual phenomenon? (laughs) Well, Robert Menzies, of course, saw himself as leading those who founded the Liberal Party. He addressed that issue in his memoirs and he felt deeply, I think, personally, that the pressure was on him to bring the fragments of the party he then led but was breaking up before his eyes, the United Australia Party, together into one party. And his great challenge was to work out how to do that. How do you unite people in different states who've been under one umbrella, the United Australia umbrella, but in several states are now coming apart and forming different parties and competing with each other for votes and fighting elections as disparate groups. And the enormous challenge that he faced was to unite those groups. The method that he chose was to set out ideas that he felt they could come together on. And this led him to call all these groups together in Canberra at what is now called historically, I suppose, the Unity Conference, which began on the 14th of October 1944 and sat over the weekend and on Monday the 16th announced the formation of the new party. Now, that was in many ways a quite remarkable, almost miraculous achievement given the state of politics on his own side that existed beforehand. And how did he do that? Well, he did it quite deliberately by providing them with what today we might call a narrative about the kind of country that he wanted Australia to be, what the dangers were that Australia faced internally and externally, and how those dangers might be best addressed. And he was very detailed about all of this. His speech to the Unity Conference was probably one of the great political speeches of Australian history. Because it was such a powerful narrative, people went into that conference not knowing how they were going to come out of it. But Menzies had been thinking hard and long about this and priming people up and talking to the press barons and writing letters to his own parliamentarian so that when he got to Canberra for that unity conference, quite a number of people had come knowing that Menzies was going to propose a liberal philosophy as the basis for unity. And Menzies had made that pretty clear. It's true all parties have ideas, and indeed it's worth remembering in this context as a background to the whole series of events that politics has often been described, particularly by someone like John Howard, 
and Menzies himself as a battle of ideas. And there was a huge battle of ideas raging in Australia at that time. The formation of the party was, in a sense, a very idealistic and practical effort in the minds of those who were there in Canberra to save liberal democracy in Australia from the external and internal pressures. The external pressures, of course, were war and conflict. The internal pressures were the deprivation of liberty, the centralisation of power that was necessary to fight the war, but also a party in government, the Labor Party, which had a socialist objective. And that socialist objective meant that government was going to have a much more controlling role over people's lives after the war than it had beforehand. And Menzies saw this as an enormous threat to individual liberty, to the right of people to run their own lives, and, of course, to the future of Australian politics. David, I wonder if we could talk a bit about the predecessors to the Liberal Party and how they conceptualised of their own political philosophies because Menzies had been working on his own brand of Australian liberalism, his own philosophical ideas and how that would form the basis of what was to become the Liberal Party's political philosophy over a period of well, many years really, but of course he's articulating them in speeches and radio broadcasts, the famous one being the Forgotten People broadcasts. But did you see that with Alfred Deakin, for example, with the protectionists or George Reid with the free trade and when they fused? I mean, was there an articulation over the years of philosophical ideas on the centre-right that were grounding and forming a foundation for what Menzies would then inherit and develop on? Or was this quite a unique approach, do you think, of Robert Menzies to actually try and encapsulate a kind of a vibe, so to speak, of centre-right ideas, liberal, the small L liberal ideas into something that was neatly packaged as the Liberal Party? Well, in one sense, it wasn't unique, and you rightly point to the Liberal parties that existed at Federation, the ones led by Alfred Deakin on the one hand and George Reid on the other. They both considered themselves Liberal parties with a capital L. That's how they referred to it themselves. Well, to be a Conservative was a bit of a derogatory term, well, wasn't it, back as then? as George Reid said, there is no Conservative <laughs> movement in Australia. We are a Liberal nation. But Reid and, and Deacon argued with each other over whether a Liberal party could be protectionist, that is, not supporting free trade, like the British Liberal Party did. And it took them quite a while to argue that out and finally come together in a united Liberal Party in 1909. And that Liberal Party, in fact, survived to form its own government. Deakin led the first Liberal government. He was followed by Joseph Cook, who led the second Liberal government. And the Liberal Party survived in the States as well, almost through the war. But At that point, philosophy really took second place to the need for Australian national security. And, of course, the First World War was managed with enormous difficulty politically in Australia because socialist thinking had become very strongly entrenched in the Labor Party. And while the two leaders of the Labor Party during that period, Andrew Fisher and William Hughes, Billy Hughes, was what we might call today, I suppose, centrist, somewhat liberal, not radically socialist. But they were increasingly opposed within the party by factions. And in the end, the issue of conscription split the Labor Party wide open and Hughes walked out. Now, at that point, the liberals really had the choice of staying where they were with the philosophy that they had or narrowing their focus on simply winning the war. And Hughes was Prime Minister and remained Prime Minister even when he was kicked out of the Labor Party or walked out, depending on whose side you take. But he was still Prime Minister and the Liberals, who were then in opposition, decided that they would have to go with him as Prime Minister. And they, with great regret, and you can read this in the literature of the time, with great regret, they gave up the Liberal name They had the organisation. Hughes, when he left the Labor Party, had no party organisation. He needed one. He needed the Liberals to support him, and they did. But they changed the name of the Joint Party to the Nationalist Party. 
and that did not have a strong political philosophy because it combined Hughes's view of the world, which was somewhat anti-capitalist. In fact, he'd used that expression on one occasion to describe himself and some of the old Deaconite liberal ideas, which did involve a lot of government intervention. Mm. So the nationalists governed with difficulty in maintaining their unity after the end of the war. And when the Great Depression hit, of course, it was disastrous. The Nationalist Party was already divided between those who wanted to restore liberalism and those who were prepared to go along with the overblown state, if you like, that had grown up through protectionism and industry regulation, marketing boards, government statutory authorities in the period beginning before the war, but really exaggerated by the war and then so strangling the economy in regulation that economic growth was very difficult to achieve during the 1920s. When the Depression struck, the Nationalists came to pieces. Menzies, at the time, at the end of the 20s, went into politics as a Nationalist, but his father-in-law went into politics starting up a new party called the Australian Liberal Party. And they said, we must get back to a philosophy of liberalism. And they tried to do that at the state level. But Menzies decided, really, you couldn't have a separate Liberal Party alongside the Nationalist Party. And so he set up the Young Nationalists to be Liberal voices within the Nationalist Party. I always find it amusing. There's a lovely quote by Billy Hughes, as someone says, Mr. Hughes, you've been a member of every political party in Australia. I mean, what do you really stand for? He said, ah, not the country party. I had to draw the line somewhere. <laughs> well, <laughs> Menzies point. would probably not have, in his <laughs> early days in politics, subjected very much to that because he drew the line <laughs> at the country party as well mm. because the country party was always wanting, in his view, special privileges for the rural communities and farmers. And these privileges were often bought at the expense of what he considered proper liberal market principles that applied to everybody. So the Nationalist Party was essentially a one objective party. It was a win the war party. When the war was won, it didn't have the glue that held it together effectively. And it was in constant internal debate over what was the right policy to pursue. When the Depression struck, the same sort of event repeated itself because the Nationalist Party wasn't able to cope. Lyons, the former acting treasurer in Scullin's government, left the party because he thought its big spending credit expansion policies were utterly insane at a time when Australia couldn't borrow because its debt was so great and decided to lead a popular movement against the extreme left represented then by Jack Lang in New South Wales and form a political movement to restore sound government. That was the birth of the United Australia Party and Menzies saw that party as in many ways very similar to the Nationalist Party. It had a single objective, beat the Depression. It was quite effective in doing that and it won several elections in a row and Australia did, in fact, beat the Depression. Kane said its policies were remarkably successful. But again, when the war struck, it didn't really know which way to go. And when you look at the Nationalists and the United Australia Party, these parties that are set up to deal with a set of circumstances, I mean, once they're resolved, there's never really much of a future. How do you build on, okay, we're a Depression-fighting party, we're a war-fighting party, but you know, in times of peace, in times of prosperity, our raison d'etre disappears and what do you stand for? That's a big question. The other thing I wanted you to reflect on, David, when you look at those early centre-right parties and they're under the banner of Liberal because no one wants to be a Conservative and they're obviously not socialist, that's sort of the alternative view and Labor Party really fills that space, a lot of the policies they're promoting are a liberal. I mean, as you say, protectionism, white Australia, which is a form of protectionism and immigration protection, a lot of state intervention in the economy, marketing boards and the like, wage arbitration. Was there not a sense or a tension in debates that calling yourself liberals when you're promoting policies that are illiberal, that's actually pretty contradictory? These were big tensions and they remained to some extent, tensions throughout Menzies' whole time in government. 
both during the war and particularly after the war, after 1949. Protectionism remained apparently the national policy and was the national policy. White Australia was still there, but Menzies as a Liberal did his best to erode that policy. The state enterprises remained in the states and they had to be dealt with at some time and that didn't happen until the 1980s. So there were these issues that had come out of Australia's early histories that Liberals were uncomfortable with. Menzies was uncomfortable with all those policies. He didn't like the centralised arbitration system. He'd attacked it during the 1920s. He wasn't very open on protection, I'd have to say, at that time, because it had created very powerful interests to defend it. All the protected industries were agitating very strongly, as you say, on the centre-right side of politics for increased protection rather than less. Menzies' liberalism was expressed in the view that protective policies had to be economically sound, and I think he knew in his heart of hearts that you couldn't have protective policies that were economically sound. And eventually, if you emphasised the economic soundness of the policies, they would come under effective fire. And that happened, began to happen during the 1970s and became obvious during the 1980s. But what was really worrying Menzies in the 1940s was that the war had created a huge centralisation of power in government. Government had censorship powers, which it used. Wartime propaganda was based on hatred of the opponents, the Japanese in particular, which Menzies thought was laying a very poor foundation for peace. And the Labor Party was threatening to maintain the wartime controls into peace as a way of implementing socialism. And so Menzies saw an increasingly totalitarian threat hanging over the nation, which he believed that an appeal to liberal values and individual freedom and responsibility could deal with. So he tried to mobilise those ideas at the Unity Conference. And there were a number of people at the Unity Conference, people like Ernest White, and my father was there as an observer from the Institute of Public Affairs, which he was the first director of and the economic advisor to. And people like W.H. Anderson, who led a Liberal Party based really in the ex-servicemen's area, So there were a group of people, including his main parliamentary supporters, who were liberally inclined. And he saw the opportunities, with the support of these people, to establish a new party basing its unity on a quite specific philosophy of liberalism. He set the choice up politically this way. He said, if Labor gets in, it's going to use the authority of government to try to manage the economy. And that will not succeed. It won't create and encourage enterprise. It won't create the growth that Labor is hoping to see, the improving standards of living. And it's going to threaten the right of people to decide how they're going to live their lives, what jobs they're going to do, what businesses, small or large, they're going to try to establish. And it's going to be a very divisive philosophy because part of Labor's socialism was central control and government planning of the economy. But the other part of it was the belief that Australia was engaged in a kind of submerged civil war between the classes, what Menzies was to call later on the foul doctrine of the class war. And so he saw Australia being torn apart rather than united into a harmonious and prosperous country where people had freedom if the Labor approach to policy was allowed to continue. And he said to the Unity Conference delegates, there is a desperate need in Australia at the moment to revive liberal thought. And most of the people there agreed with that. Well, clearly, because he did get an agreement to form his party. Those who didn't agree were persuaded. (laughs) (laughs) Tell me about the key players who came to this conference. So they were coming from different perspectives. They'd formed different political parties. They were splitting apart. The United Australia parties basically become electorally non-existent in the 43 election and then falls away. So you do have this group of people who are centre-right, but how that is implemented in a political sense, in political representation, they have very different views. Was it the narrative that he was able to develop, the sort of broader narrative that brought them together? 
was it general enough that they could say, look, we can agree on that general message, but in the implementation, that's perhaps where we will have disagreements in the future? I think he felt that the liberal philosophy provided a comprehensive approach to government. When he was pressed to spell out what the nature of this philosophy was, he said it's not to form a party which is a business party, which is there to oppose the trade union party. It's there to form a party which is going to respect the individual citizen. And, of course, the base he was aiming at was the Australian middle class, where he felt liberal values were fundamentally supported, even if not finding a political voice that was effective for them. The sort of values that implied people wanted to buy their own home, to take responsibility for their own lives, to educate their children, to save and set up small businesses, to be enterprising and active. And he emphasised also the spiritual dimension of the middle class in terms of its belief in longer term values that meant the dignity of every person and the right of choice of every person had to be respected. He put those values to the Unity Conference and he confronted as he looked out on the Friday in the afternoon when he got up to give his speech, a conference that was very diverse in its character. It had people particularly, of course, from each of the states and parochialism was very strong in Australia and every state was differently organised and he was asking them to give up what they had to dissolve the organisations that they represented it in front of him and to join a new party. Now, you can imagine that was the last thing many of them were actually thinking about at the time. And only one state in the end stood out against that, and that was South Australia. Yes, that's uh, right. Where, and they did till the 70s. <laughs> uh, and when they announced the formation of the Liberal Party on the Monday, they made a special exception in that statement, allowing the Liberal and Country League in South Australia to keep its own name. It eventually, of course, became the branch of the Liberal Party in that state. But he also was looking at people who had different views about the role of business in politics. What you've called the centre-right was very much influenced by the fact that it had relied since Deakin on business organisations to raise money for it. Mm. And Menzies was deeply concerned about that. And he had a personal reason for being concerned about it because when Lyons had died and he became leader of the UAP in 1939, there was an effort by one of these business groups called the National Union to bring back Stanley Melbourne Bruce as the leader of the party. And Menzies thought that this was utterly inappropriate to have an interest group trying to manage who was the leader of the major not, party Not in least Parliament. because he was wanting to take not, the, not least the because, job. Not <laughs> because he intended to be <laughs> yes. the leader I mean, himself. Let's be honest, there's always a little bit of self-interest. Oh, there's in definitely <laughs> self-interest there, yes. But I think it's worth saying that Menzies was an exceptional person. It is true that there were others whose support was absolutely necessary to the formation of the party, people like Elizabeth Couchman or WH Anderson or the role of bodies like the IPA, which were strongly advocating a liberal principles to the management of the economy. So he did have support there, but there were people there who were much more simply conservative and interest-based and concerned about defending their interests. And there was also an argument over the role of women in the party. And the women themselves had become in the middle class through their political organisations, which were quite strong in a number of the states. The strongest of them was the Australian Women's National League, which was in Victoria and Tasmania, and I think had been active for a while in South Australia as well. Elizabeth Couchman was its voice, and they felt that women did not have a role in a politics dominated by men. And so one of the crucial elements of actually bringing the Liberal Party into existence was Menzies reaching an agreement with Couchman that the AWNL would become the women's section of the Liberal Party. Was that considered quite unusual at the time that a, women were so deeply involved in the formation of a political party? And you wouldn't have seen that on the Labor side, of course. That was very much underpinned by the trade union movement, which was based in the workplace where women really weren't present. Yes, Menzies gained tremendous support from women because of 
his openness to the political role of women. On the Liberal side of politics, that role really goes right back to Federation. The AWNL was formed in 1904 and Deakin had a women's section as part of his Liberal Party in Victoria. And women's sections came into existence in the parties of the centre-right through the 20s and 30s. And there were quite a number of women delegates to the Unity Conference in 1944. So Menzies was able to make a very powerful appeal to women. And when he campaigned in 1946 with the new Liberal Party, he directed his speech particularly to women. And his view was that there should be no discrimination against women in any area of political life, that women should be just as welcome in politics as men, and that any attempt to exclude women to legally disadvantage them had to be addressed. And I guess appeals to individual freedom and individuals' ability to create their own wealth and build their own home and not be told how to interact with the economy or the education system or the workplace by an outside force was very empowering for a woman who might otherwise be being told what to do by a husband or family member or workplace. Absolutely. Other outside forces, yes. the church or whatever, yeah. That was one of the potentially revolutionary aspects of liberalism. And that's why I have some doubt about the term centre-right, because the right implies conservative. Mm. And the liberals are really the third point of the triangle. You could have radicals, statist socialists at one corner. You could have conservatives at another wanting to preserve what is. And then you've got the liberals whose philosophy can be adopted by conservatives and often is because once liberal institutions become established, as they were in Australia from colonial days, to be conservative could also mean you were liberal in inclination. But liberalism had within it a very progressive reformist standpoint that could be formulated and the role of women was one. The role of Aboriginal people in Australia was another where the liberals were leading and of course it was very hard to justify white Australia on the basis of liberal philosophy once you had a large number of people in Australia who didn't have Anglo-Saxon backgrounds. And Menzies, although there are examples of him defending what one would say with white Australia, he didn't like the term. He used the term homogeneity. And by that, he meant, as Joseph Cook had meant even before the First World War, a nation that was agreed on its values. Yes. And And there were appeals to social cohesion, weren't there? There are speeches Menzies gave about, say, people from Asia. We don't think they're any less of a race, but we are a British-based society and for our social cohesion, we invite people who share those values but share that heritage rather than people of other nations and races throughout Asia who would find it hard to fit in. So I mean, while we would find that view unacceptable today, he didn't justify it on a racial hierarchy basis, but more how do we run this country in a cohesive way. And he adopted a number of policies in government, particularly the Colombo Plan, which brought thousands of students from Asia to Australia. So it changed the appearance of the Australian street, if you like. And the immigration policies that he pursued in office also moderated white Australia, eventually got rid of the dictation test and allowed people who were not of European background to become citizens. So my judgment as a historian is that If you look at what Menzies actually did, although he wanted to reassure the nation that it wasn't going to suddenly turn into a nation of people with very different views, and he emphasised homogeneity and respect for Australia's traditions and law, he was perfectly happy to see the ethnic mix of Australia grow, which it did, of course, spectacularly during his time as Prime Minister. Yes, particularly during the 50s and 60s. David, something that's the very interesting about the formation of the Liberal Party is how they dealt with finances, party finances. So money in politics, political donations, the influence of donors on political parties is still a big issue to this day. Menzies was very concerned about the influence of special interests in politics. I mean, obviously the country party, he had concerns about that as a kind of a special interest party but business groups putting pressure on political parties to go a certain way. And he wanted a political party that didn't have those issues. 
I'm not so sure if that's ended up being the case today, but what was his intention back in 1944 of how to deal with money in politics and get rid of those? Well, it's useful to set that into a context. Menzies did not like interest-based pressure group politics. He had been an opponent of that style of politics, which he called unprincipled politics, selfish politics, only concerned with individual interests and not the shared interests of everybody. And he certainly didn't want business groups providing their interest and influence within the Liberal Party in a way that distorted its policies in a selfish direction. So he was very keen that the party collect its own money and that the membership fee of the party should be substantial so that it could collect substantial sums of money on its own and parliamentarians were not to receive money. If the party was to collect money from business, then it would be through the central secretariat of the party and its central organisations so that the party would be preserved from that external influence on its pre-selections, on its leadership and, of course, on its policies, that it would be able to make its policies according to liberal principles. Now, that remained, I think, in practice, uh, the philosophy of the party, certainly right through into the 1980s. But as politics itself has become much more expensive and as corporates have been more and more inclined to go their own way and to support both sides of politics. The attempt by the Liberal Party in each of the states to secure its finances become extremely hard and we're seeing a tension now between Labor policy, which is to restrict donations that could be given by individuals and businesses while it has access to trade union funds. The Liberal Party doesn't have generally access to outside funds. But there are such groups around, of course. There's the Cormac Foundation in Victoria, which is a liberal-minded organisation which supplies funds to the Liberal Party federally and at the state level. And what Menzies would think of that, I think he would have concerns that a group like that, even if it didn't actually do so, was well-positioned to influence the policies and management of the Liberal Party. Do you think Menzies' view, though, is overly idealistic? I mean, the reality is he basically wanted to rely on an individual person, not a corporate entity, but a person donating money and that they would be donating money in a somewhat detached fashion to a say, the political party's headquarters rather than to, you know, I'm going to support the David Kemp campaign for Goldstein, for example. So... I mean, fine, but then really it's rats and mice in terms of dollars. So was it just because, as you say back then, politics was a bit cheaper, political campaigns were a bit cheaper, so that idealism could have worked then, but these days, I mean, really, it's hard to imagine. I know that the Teals, for example, claim that they get lots of $100, $200 donations and are able to raise millions on that basis, but except for Simon Holmes Court. But I sort of wonder, I mean, a business still has an interest. There are still shareholders who have an interest in the policy direction of a party. Why shouldn't they be allowed to donate and make representations about the direction they see the country should go in? Yes, I think it's unduly idealistic to think that individuals alone without corporate funds could fund a major party these days. And you can look around the world and it's it's impossible to find a major political party which does not get corporate donations. I think the Menzies philosophy really says, well, how are you raising these corporate donations? How are you dealing with them? Are they being used to influence individual MPs or are they coming to the party as a whole? And I think that that is the issue that all the major political parties face when they're dealing with powerful organised interests which do have money outside the party. And, of course, the trade unions have become much wealthier. Corporates, on the whole, are drawing back from donations. So I think that the effort by the party to encourage interests in the community to donate to a party which will create a level playing field, uh, fair laws for everybody, and develop policies which will benefit all individual citizens and 
those who wish to set up economic enterprises is really where one has to look for principles for modern fundraising. What do you think he would have made of proposals to just have public funding for political parties? Well, I find that hard to say and differentiate it from my own views because I find myself appalled at the thought I think it really entrenches the status quo then. It How do absolutely you encourage entr- a new party when the status quo parties, existing parties, get the public funding, but you need to get elected, don't you, as a political party in order to receive this public funding, I assume. I think Menzies would have been horrified at the thought that citizens who didn't support a party could be compelled yes, through their taxes. to give some of their tax money to that political <laughs> yes. party. He saw the principle of voluntarism as very important in the running of a democracy. As you say, I think once a party becomes dependent on public funding, it in a way loses its connection to the electorate. It becomes isolated And that's a real danger. And particularly if we move into an era as we have now, where there is a big division in the community between those with higher education who occupy all the major institutional centres of power in the country, including the parliament, and the bulk of the population who do not fall into that category. When that occurs, you have to look very closely at the structure of our institutions and see to what extent they tend to isolate the political class from the rest of the community. Yes, and I think another phenomenon that's of great concern is the falling membership of political parties. So in the 50s, it was quite normal to be a member of a political party. It was almost part of your sort of social life. You're a member of a tennis club, the cricket club, go to the local church, the CWA or whatever, and then a political party. Now it's a really, really unusual thing to be a member of a political party. The membership rates are just minuscule compared to what they've been in the past for both sides of politics, Labor and Liberal. For different reasons. But that must then create a further disconnect from the community and the politicians who are elected as representatives of their communities but their political parties because they don't have that base of huge membership of a political party to refer to. I think it exaggerates the isolation of the political class from the rest of the community. It's an inherent issue in a liberal democracy because, of course, in a liberal democracy, the real interest of most citizens is living their own lives, Mm. not being involved in politics where, in fact, government can only affect It's very hard for you and I to understand this, David, I know. (laughs) (laughs) So you want the aware citizen... Yes. But not necessarily the citizen who's heavily involved in politics all the time. The politicised community is not necessarily a harmonious community. There are times in a country's life, though, when the individual democratic citizen arouses himself or herself and looks at what influence they can have on politics and whether they are satisfied with the current politics. And the Liberal Party's big liberal movement at the time of its formation and up to 1949 and into the 1950s was the result of a public who had become deeply concerned over the government of the country and the nature of the political conflicts and that were being waged at the time. But As the country becomes more prosperous and comfortable, of course, people feel what my involvement is not so necessary. I can go back to my private life. I think the parties themselves need to look at their structures. The Labor Party structure gives such enormous prominence to trade unions that the individual branch member can have only limited influence, except through the trade union movement. In the Liberal Party, the branch structure has been a way of actually discouraging many individuals from joining a party because a lot of branches don't want new members. They want the state council seats and they want the positions in the party which a smaller branch can give. And I think there is an argument that political parties really need to be much more welcoming and open and more subtle and expansive in the way that they attract those who are political activists to become party members and to feel that in doing so they're better realising their own values. And I think that's a challenge for every Australian major political party at the moment. 
Before we get on to some reflections on the modern day Liberal Party and how it is the inheritor of the legacy of the 1944 party, I wonder if you could talk a bit about the use of the terms progressive and social justice. Now, in 2024, progressive and social justice to me sound like very left-wing terminology. They're, They're associated with definitely the left of politics, potentially the hard left of politics, at least in Australia. But Menzies used those terms quite frequently when talking about his aspirations and political philosophy. So they obviously didn't have left-wing connotations in 1944. What did those terms actually mean at the time and what would have been Menzies' understanding of progressive and social justice? I think progressive meant little more than moving forward. It meant dealing with social problems where people are deprived of dignity or respect where the economy was being suffocated by undue regulation, a progressive party was one who freed up human individual energies and allowed the country to change according to the values and wishes peacefully exercised of individual people. The word progressive had been used in politics back as far as federation almost in some of the states. It was used by country people during the 1920s, progressive country party. There was a progressive party in New South Wales. Um, in you the had progress associations, didn't you? There were pro- progress associations, a very good example of yeah. the positive connotation of the word. And in progress associations, it means essentially development. Yes. And I think that's what Menzies had in mind, that economy will recover from the war if we free up people to exercise their enterprise and reward them for it through an appropriate tax system. So I think progressive, he had in mind, the meaning of it was really one that would see Australia moving forward and building a prosperous society. In terms of social justice, term is one that I've had some hesitation using. Friedrich Hayek never liked that term because he felt that saying what is and what is not socially just is such a subjective thing that it just opens the door to meddling ideologues, influencing policy. But there is a valid way, I believe, in which you can use the term, and that is where laws actually impose disadvantages or restrictions on certain groups of people or policies disadvantage certain groups of people. And I notice in a recent book by Tim Wilson that he uses the term social justice in relation to housing policy because he thinks that a range of policies have advantaged a certain generation, but that younger people don't have access to the same opportunities and they have the disadvantage of laws which make housing more expensive and unobtainable. And socially just policy would deal with the lack of opportunities that the existing policy structure creates. I don't think Menzies would have seen the legal disadvantages of women as being socially just. He would have seen that as a social injustice and the same would apply to Aboriginal people. So in that context has a like a Burkean connotation, then you're making sure that the policies of today look after the future generations as much as they've looked after the previous generations. Indeed, yes. And he's really about addressing inequalities, structural inequalities. Mm. The party today in 2024, so 80 years on, is of course quite a different political party as you would expect it to be. How has the Liberal Party, in your view, been able to maintain a philosophical stance sort of grounded in those 1944 values that were articulated? Or has it not? Maybe you think it's not been able to ground itself because we don't talk, I don't think, in in such ideological terms, because the ideological debates aren't so stark as they were, say, in the 40s with, you know, Chifley's socialism and Menzies' liberalism. They were massive divergences of outlook on how the world should be run and how Australia should be run. Well, here we get to the question of what is philosophy and ideology. Menzies made a distinction between the two, and the philosophy was really systematic set of ideas that had objectives, it had supporting values, and ultimately it would lead to policies that respected human nature 
and the nature of society and the possibilities of social change and were realistic about the nature of government. So it was quite a traditional view of what philosophy is generally understood to mean. Now, ideologies tend to be much narrower than that. They tend to be programmatic. They believe that certain solutions are going to be imposed come what may without asking profound questions about what does this tell us about human nature? What's the impact of these policies going to be on society? Can you create a harmonious society through these kind of policies? And of course, one of the difficulties that the left has always faced in Australia since the 19th century has been that it's tended to support forms of identity politics, which resulted in Menzies' era in class war and today involves the attack on certain genders and colours and giving undue emphasis to people's skin rather than to their qualities and characters as human beings. And again, in green ideologies, you see certain solutions being promoted and certain policies being opposed, but not on genuinely philosophical grounds. They're just a narrow set of programs which achieve a level of political support at a time. So Menzies like to distinguish a sort of narrow ideology from philosophy. But I think the Liberal Party has maintained remarkably successfully its character as a party with a philosophy, not without difficulty, because Menzies' values and objectives and exemplary policies were included in the first party platform in the Constitution and the fundamental values and policies based on those values can be found in, I think, every state platform that exists around Australia. And leaders themselves have promoted discussion of the party's philosophy and directed attention to its existence. And I'm thinking of people not only like Menzies, who talked about liberalism, but leader like Fraser, who addressed it in a number of major statements and speeches, and who always thought of himself as a liberal, a Menzian liberal, emphasising the dignity of the individual person. And of course, John Howard, who has discussed the philosophy of the Liberal Party at length in various contexts and has argued that it's a combination of the Liberal tradition and the Burkean conservative tradition. I mean, Burke was actually a Whig and, in modern terms, more Liberal and Conservative, but no doubt his thinking has had a big impact on how the Liberal Party parliamentarians view their role, that they're there to implement ideas that they believe are right for the country and represent the shared interests of people and citizens and not there to promote special interests or be delegates for some wealthy and powerful person. It's interesting, though, that the term conservative has become quite an acceptable term now in centre-right politics, whereas 100 years ago it was absolute no-go zone. No one wanted to own the term conservative. It was a British a British political party and a British idea of of aristocracy and noblesse oblige. And uh, we didn't want truck with that in Australia, a country of egalitarianism, the fair go for all. No bunyip aristocracy for us, thanks. That's happened over the last 20 years or so, I would say. And it is a difficulty, I think, for the Liberal Party because a certain section of the population, particularly young people under 35, are not much interested in the status quo. And conservative always implies status quo, whereas liberal implies a willingness to change and not only that, but points to a direction of change and progress. And that's why Menzies didn't like the word conservative, because a conservative really doesn't point to the future, whereas a party can't be progressive unless it actually has ideas and values which point it towards change that's going to effectively better realise what people are looking for in politics. And so he insisted on the word liberal. And my own feeling is that the Liberal Party will move back towards an emphasis on liberal because the word conservative, however effective it's been in the past in Britain, and it's not, of course, doing well at the moment, and however influential it's been in the United States, where it's encompassed economic liberalism, under the term conservative, whereas we haven't done that in Australia. It's more 
I think that as we're now part of a world of communication and people hear the word conservative a lot. I mean, it's quite interest me that Howard, while using the word, did so in a context where he was conscious that globalism had adversely affected rural communities. And he wanted to give a strong message that liberal policies that he was going to pursue would ensure the health of rural Australia. And he opposed Hanson's One Nation on that ground. The notion that somehow or other there is a philosophy of conservatism which can replace liberalism or incorporate liberalism, I think, is in Australia not well grounded because Australian liberalism from Menzies on has always emphasised the social importance to a democratic society of the family, the home, the great conservative institutions. Menzies himself emphasised the spiritual life and if indeed the parliament has become somewhat divided between a political party where atheism tends to predominate and one where religious belief tends to predominate and that's not a happy position for society. Well, David, thank you for such, I think, expansive discussion on the formation of Liberal Party, but also the political ideas and philosophy, less so ideology, of course, of that Liberal Party back in the 1940s and earlier and, of course, to present day. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you very much, Georgina. That's it for this week's episode of Afternoon Light, the podcast of the Robert Menzies Institute. Please make sure to subscribe and catch up on our latest online content on our website or on Twitter, LinkedIn or Facebook. 